This video is sponsored by Squarespace. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and welcome to another episode of Fables Explained, the show where I take the most well-known fables and folklore from all around the world and try to find answers to the questions people have about them. Usually that entails tracing their roots through history and figuring out the truth about where these fantastic tales came from, but today we're doing a slightly different version of that. See, back on February 29th, we uncovered the truth about the Ballad of John Henry over on Messed Up Origins to close out Black History Month. For those who missed it or don't know about the folktale, I'll include a link below, but basically it follows a newly freed African-American slave who sacrificed himself to prove that he could outwork a steam engine and ensure that his fellow workers get the pay they were promised. Only in that episode we learn the even darker truth behind the already dark story. The man believed to be the real John Henry was a freed slave who was turned penitentiary inmate as the result of a beyond corrupt judicial system down in Confederate America. For the petty crime of shoplifting, he was sentenced to 10 years in the Virginia State Penitentiary where he and hundreds of other inmates were rented out to railroad companies and forced to work in dangerous and deadly conditions. Well, due to the recent events going on in our country, namely the disgusting murder of George Floyd and the calls for change that have ensued, I thought now would be a good time to revisit John Henry's story, specifically his unjustifiable prison sentence and how exactly the judicial system was rigged to punish African Americans as harshly as possible for actions that shouldn't even have been considered crimes, kind of like it is today. Just a warning, you are going to see a few more ad breaks than normal on this episode, but that's because 100% of this video's AdSense will be donated to organizations supporting Black Lives Matter, because they most certainly fucking do. So if you want to help support the BLM movement and raise awareness of the fact that just because slavery was abolished in 1865 doesn't mean that African Americans were free, make sure you watch this video until the end and share it with anyone you know that'll put the info to good use. As always, I've got to ask you to hit that like button before we get started, as well as subscribe for new content like this on a weekly basis. And now let's talk about the incarceration of John Henry. So before we get into the details of John Henry's truly heinous crime of shoplifting, I think it'd be a good idea to set the scene so you have the required context. Now this tragedy starts sometime after the Civil War ended on April 6th, 1865. For reasons that historians still aren't totally sure about, John Henry was living in Prince George County, Virginia at this time. Some believe he may have been a Union soldier that lingered in the area after the war, but his name doesn't appear in the military records of the US colored troops. And we know from his prison records that he was only five foot one and just 18 years old by the war's end, so it's likely that he wasn't allowed to be a soldier due to his age and short stature. I know we already talked about it in the last episode, but how wild is it that all of John Henry's legends describe him as this juggernaut of a human being, when in reality he would have been considered short even for that time? I think that says something about his personality and the content of his character. An alternate theory suggests he could have been a cook for the Union camp, worked as a day laborer, lined track for the US military railroad, or even harvested bones for the burial corps. Call me crazy, but I think that last job would have been sort of fun. It'd be like when they dug up Billy Bats and Goodfellas. Oh, here's a leg. It's a wing. <laughs> what do you like, the leg or the wing, Henry? Anyway, regardless of his reasons for being there, John Henry and thousands of other black men and women chose to stick around Prince George County after the war ended. And this agitated both the local white population and those in political power who still believed that Henry and anyone who looked like him should be considered property. The problem was that for Virginia to be accepted into the newly reformed United States and receive any benefits at all from the federal government, they had to consent to the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. Now, there's some people out there who believe, or at least like to claim during arguments on Twitter, that this was the end of oppression here in America. The slaves were now freed and allowed to live their lives however they wanted, but those people are just straight up wrong. I mean, sure, President Lincoln proposed limited suffrage for the African American community, but he was shot in the head by John Wilkes Booth only a few days later, and his successor, Andrew Johnson, felt that certain powers should be left to the state government. Under his reconstruction policies, the former Confederate states were required to uphold the abolition of slavery, swear loyalty to the Union, and pay off their war Debt. But beyond those limitations, the states were pretty much given free reign to rebuild their own governments, and this allowed for some massive loopholes to be exploited. So roughly a year after the war's end in April of 1866, when John Henry committed the horrendous crime of shoplifting from a tiny little store called Wiseman's Grocery, he became the victim of thinly veiled state policy that was designed to keep blacks under the control of those with money, influence, and power. 
Now, to fully understand how John Henry could have possibly been sent to prison for 10 years for what, all sarcasm aside, is a petty crime, we have to know a little more about how the justice system operated in post-Civil War Virginia. Spoiler alert, it's pretty fucking racist. It starts with the establishment of the ironically named Freedmen's Bureau. I say ironically because despite being created to help former slaves and poor white people in the post-Civil War South, it did an awful lot to hurt them. Now, I do want to make it clear that the Bureau wasn't all bad and just because someone worked for them doesn't automatically make them a bad person, but there was a combination of factors that led to it ultimately becoming corrupt and failing at its intended purpose. One, there was a massive lack of both funding and personnel, not to mention that because it was overseen by the War Department, many of those personnel were former Confederate soldiers. Number two, never before in history had any government taken responsibility for such a huge refugee population, so they had to figure out the best way of handling that. And number three, the Bureau was strongly opposed by white Southerners and even the President and Andrew Johnson, who I'm starting not to like. Now that last point is extremely important. The Freedmen's Bureau had not one, but two powerful enemies who were willing to do whatever it took to make them fail. On the administrative side, you have the goddamn president, who would do everything in his power to deprive the Bureau of the resources that would lead to its success. Not only did he veto legislation that would give the Bureau more funding and power, but he also fired employees who he felt were too sympathetic to blacks. And any agents, who were essentially social workers that managed to hide their sympathy while still working diligently to help those in need were often harassed and even assaulted by white Southerners and were the regular targets of the Ku Klux Klan. Despite all this, the Bureau did have some successes across the states. It fed millions of people, built hospitals, negotiated labor contracts for ex-slaves, and settled labor disputes. It also helped former slaves legalize marriages and locate lost relatives, and it assisted black veterans. Now keep all those good deeds in mind while I tell you the rest of this story, because if you're anything like me, it's going to infuriate you. Because while there were good, honest, hardworking agents at the Freedmen's Bureau, the one who arrested John Henry and handled his case was not one of them. Charles H. Byrd was a former Union lieutenant who was hired as the assistant commissioner at the Bureau for Prince George County. You would think that someone who fought for the Union would be on John Henry's side, but Byrd's time in the service was pretty unusual. For one, he didn't volunteer, he was drafted. Two, the original soldiers in the company he oversaw almost all refused to re-enlist after the required service of 90 days, while the rest of the soldiers in the regiment stayed. I hate to make assumptions, but that's gotta say something about either Bird's personality or leadership style, doesn't it? In three, and this is the big one, during his time in the army, Bird suffered a seriously disfiguring and debilitating injury when a musket ball was embedded four inches deep into his skull. The real messed up part about that is the Confederate soldiers who were attacking his company were at a range where only their cannons were effective, so there's a good chance that Bird was shot by one of his own men. Whether it was an accident or someone was just sick and tired of his bullshit, We'll never know. It only gets worse from here though. Bird was abandoned by his own men and rescued by the Confederates who held him in their prison for seven months with an open wound in his head that regularly oozed blood and pus. Don't you just love that word? Ooze? It's even better than moist in my opinion. It wasn't until the Union made a special request for his exchange that he was returned to his allies and doctors finally took a look at him. It took them days of probing and making the hole even larger to get most of the ball's fragments out of his skull and Bird even reported that a tiny piece of his brain fell out with the last incision. Babe, do we have any Jello? I suddenly got this craving for Jello. Surprisingly soon after his surgeries, Bird was declared fit for work and rejoined his regiment. Though as you might expect, he was a very different person after this experience. He may not have been very very likable before, but now he had PTSD from being shot in the head and lead poisoning from the musket ball left him with the inability to focus and short-term memory loss. Not to mention the anger and bitterness that he would have about the situation and him now being deformed. Yeah, Andrew Johnson had no problem with this guy being an agent, but God forbid you feel a little bad for the former slaves and you're fired. Why do I have a feeling he would do the same thing? Now this may be controversial, but at this point, I think you're allowed to have some sympathy for Charles Byrd. What he went through, I may wish on my worst enemy, but nobody else. That being said, the way this guy handled his responsibilities as an agent of the Freedmen's Bureau makes him an absolute bottom of the barrel piece of shit scumbag. Instead of doing literally anything at all to help the newly freed slaves integrate themselves in the community, he only used his authority to protect the white folks they worked for. Whenever there was a protest over unfair wages or labor conditions, he would show up with a red 
engagement of soldiers and threatened to either arrest or assault and arrest anyone protesting. The local newspapers also accused him of renting out the federally controlled land he owned to blacks at unfairly high prices. But what may be his greatest offense is that he would act as the judge and jury of any criminal cases involving the black community, meaning the fates of the accused were entirely up to him. A man who, I just want to reiterate, had a goddamn hole in his head. And to make it even worse, because yes, it gets even worse, Bird was a heavy-handed enforcer of the Black Codes, a special set of laws that were supposedly made to crack down on crime, but in reality limited the freedoms of black people so much that they could be arrested just for going about their daily lives. For example, blacks were not allowed to testify against whites unless they were defending themselves. Vagrancy was now prohibited, which was defined as the flooding of black men and women into public spaces. In other words, if too many black folks were in a place like the grocery store at the same time, then they could be arrested and charged with a crime, and oftentimes were sentenced to work on a plantation for no pay as their punishment. Another messed up law was that black people couldn't display an air of satisfaction, meaning they couldn't publicly talk about being happy the Civil War was over and that they were free, because if we know anything about the Confederates, it's that they were sore losers. African Americans also weren't allowed to not be employed, but the only positions being offered to them were year-long contracts for hard labor jobs where they received little pay. What's extra terrible about that one is that if any of them left their contracts early, then they had to give up all the money they earned so far, and they would be arrested, which often resulted in them being forced into unpaid labor as a punishment. And get this, in South Carolina, there were laws that prohibited blacks from having any job other than farmer or servant unless they paid an annual tax of 10 to $100. And if you were one of the good folks who wanted to actually pay your black employees a fair wage, there were laws in many Southern states to punish you too. Last but not least, under the Black Codes, punishments for property crimes increased dramatically. Horse thieves could be hanged, being inside someone's house without an invitation was proof of burglary, whether you had goods in your hand hands or not, and stealing goods valued at more than $20 was now punishable with five to 10 years in prison instead of one to five. So when Byrd arrested John Henry on that fateful day in April of 1866, he was already doomed. There was no question if he was going to go to prison, he just didn't know for how long. There was a brief glimmer of hope, though, when the Supreme Court and Congress got more involved in how the South was handling its judicial process. On April 3rd of 1866, the courts ruled that any arrests made under the Black Codes were unconstitutional, and so prisoners had to be turned over to county officials instead of agents like Charles Burr. Then, just six days later, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866, despite President Johnson's veto, making it a crime for state officials to subject anyone to different punishment, pains, or penalties by reason of his color meaning that the county sheriffs, deputies, and judges that the aforementioned accused were being turned over to could be arrested for enforcing the black codes against suspects held in custody. Like I said, it's a glimmer of hope, but unfortunately the federal courts couldn't retry every case that happened that year, and the county officials in the South weren't necessarily any less bigoted than Charles Burr, so there were still folks like John Henry that had the cards stacked against them. So much so that when Wiseman, the man who owned the grocery store that Henry had stolen from, only had the evidence to make his charges a misdemeanor instead of a felony, the judge gave him six additional months to gather more evidence. And this was after Henry had already spent six months in the Richmond jail just waiting for his trial. When the time finally came for him to be sentenced, more than a year after being arrested, the crime he was being charged for was completely different than what actually happened. They had manipulated the details of the case so that instead of Henry shoplifting an item worth only a few cents from Wiseman's store in broad daylight, he was being accused of housebreak and larceny. These charges carried a maximum sentence of 10 years in the state prison, and that's what 20 year old John Henry got. And if you watched my last video on John Henry, then you know what he spent his time in prison doing. He and hundreds of other inmates served as a cheap labor option for the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway, who forced them to work in incredibly dangerous and toxic conditions that would ultimately lead to about half of them dying from various lung conditions that strangled them slowly from the inside. So as you can see, the abolishing of slavery didn't necessarily mean the end of slavery. The implementation of those black codes wasn't just to punish black people, but specifically to keep them in chains and available as a cheap labor force for as long as possible. And one can very easily argue that a form of these practices are still being used to this day to keep the private prison industry afloat. There is a long, dark, and complicated history behind the oppression of black Americans, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, everything we talked about today happened within just a few years of the Civil War ending. We haven't even touched on Jim Crow laws, redlining, separate but equal policy, and while there may not be any official legislation left that treats blacks as second 
working class citizens, there are countless families in our country that are still feeling the effects of systemic oppression. And it's for that reason that 100% of this video's AdSense will be donated to the Equal Justice Initiative, an organization that provides legal representation to people who have been wrongly convicted, unfairly sentenced, or abused in state jails and prisons. There are way too many stories like John Henry's out there where our fellow humans are being unfairly punished for simply making a mistake or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. There is no question that our criminal justice system needs to be seriously reformed and I want to do my part to help those who have been victimized by it. So in the spirit of that, make sure you like this video, share it with your friends, and comment your thoughts about it down below. The more engagement that we have, the more likely we are to rake in those views and that means more exposure for John Henry's story and more money to the EJI. I would also greatly appreciate it if you listen to a word from our sponsor who made this episode possible, Squarespace. Let me ask you a question, Solo fam. Don't you hate it when you try to build a website but then realize you can't because you don't know how? Me too, at least until I found Squarespace. They're an all-in-one platform that gives people like you and I the ability to make our own beautiful websites without any coding experience. And by beautiful websites, I don't just mean a 2020 equivalent of your AOL profile where you can post your favorite Panic at the Disco lyrics and glorious Comic Sans. Squarespace has a massive selection of layout templates to help you get started and a variety of useful features that really let you make your website your own. I'm talking portfolios and galleries to show off your artwork, either to the public or with private clients, fully interactive graphs to display important data, and even audio collections to share your music. You can even run a full-blown store on your site using tools to help you track sales, inventory, manage shipping, and more. As I've talked about many times before, I love and trust Squarespace so much I use them to host my own website, MessedUpOrigins.com, where you can find links to video playlists, buy my favorite resources for studying myths and fables, and check out my hella soft and comfortable John Shot First merch. If someone like me, who knows roughly that much about web design, can set all that up, then you definitely can too. So head to squarespace.com for your free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash John Solo and use code John Solo to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And on that note, Solo fam, we are going to wrap this video up. I already asked you to hit that like button, but make sure you subscribe as well because I want you to. Also, don't forget to follow me on the mind melting, career ending social media platforms known as Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram if you want to stay updated on channel news, send me suggestions, or just say hi. Same goes for my little pug here. His name is Gunther, and he's quite the clout chaser, so he would love it if you followed him too. Also, it'll be his birthday on the day I post this, so happy birthday to you, bud. Do you want some presents? Do you want a birthday cake? I'll be seeing you guys unusually early next week with the long-awaited return of Messed Up Murders. Until that day comes, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. It would have been nice if you didn't lick your lips in the middle of my outro.